It's Secure Digital Life. This week, port forwarding part duh, two. We're going to do it again because you requested it. And so we're going to talk about even more port forwarding, port forwarding beyond, port forwarding out there somewhere beyond infinity. But we're going to talk about port forwarding, including demos from Doug and demos from Russ and Doug and Russ live right here uh, where we sit. In fact, I'm getting some kind of weird feedback. I think it's the voices in my head telling me not to do port forwarding. So maybe we should talk about something really creepy. Well, well, okay, let me show you. Uh, no, I, we won't do that. But this week, so hang in there. We'll be right back with port forwarding. This is a Security Weekly production. Welcome to Secure Digital Life. And you type in... Triple A porn or whatever it is you're typing in. I'm, so, I'm sorry, we, I was at a PG show. And I'm really okay. excited to be here. I'm glad you're here because somebody needs to know what's going on. That's right. Okay, so now, now somebody has to drink this. <laughs> it's another day. It's another episode. Yeah, he's looking at the wrong camera. You, oh, oh, you moved my, you put my camera over here. Eh, there you cut. Go. Basically, forget you ever saw that. I, I think actually forgetting you ever saw that would really be a good <laughs> idea at this point. All right, SDL, port forwarding. So uh, after we did the show last week on port forwarding, we talked about some basic stuff of it. A lot of people wrote in. Thank you for your comments. They were all very well received. Uh, they were all nice comments, which was really shocking. But, you know, uh, I, I know I'm good looking, but, you know, what are you going to do? I'm here with Russ in the studio. Hi, Russ. Hey, Doug. How are you? I'm pretty well. Oh, there he is. See, he's right. He is there. I wasn't just, I wasn't no. just pretending that he was here. there. So he was actually there. I, sometimes I just pretend, and, mm -hmm. and that's fun too, but you know, this time. So we're going to talk more about port forwarding and some of the common reasons that people do, do forward ports. Uh, I, I started doing port forwarding a long time ago because one of the things that I got into pretty early was VOIP telephone. And I bought a telephone system, one of these little boxes, and if they pay us, I'll say their name on the air, but they hadn't paid me yet, so you'll just have to guess. But, um, and, and VOIP phones run over the internet instead of running over what's called POTS, which is mm -hmm. plain old telephone systems, which is the old copper wire systems. And we got, we, we really early got, got that at our house and liked it a whole lot because you could forward your numbers, you could do all kinds of tricks, and it was super crazy cheap, and you could do long distance and international mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you were talking, you were talking about a security system, right? Yeah, so a friend of mine has a, a in-at-home security system, and, and, and they needed to, to use port forwarding to get uh, the security feed to their, outside the house. Right. So, I mean, that, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons you might do that. Uh, we've seen servers. We've seen, uh, I've seen DVRs that, that ask people to port forward. Uh, the most common reason people typically did it was because of, uh, of gaming. And we talked about that last week. Uh, one thing you can do is if you're interested in ports and you want to know how ports work, you can look them up. Uh, there's all kinds of lists of them. And my three most common ports, you want to do your three most common ports? Uh, let's see, 80, 25, and 110. 25 if I'm he doing this. He stole. He was looking at Yeah. <laughs> I'm not looking at that. <laughs> I didn't even see it. Uh, he, so he says, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, 80, which is a web server. Uh, and, and these are incoming. And so several people wrote comments and asked me about outgoing mm -hmm. ports. You can basically, I don't know, it's not really forwarding. It, it's like outgoing, outbound. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to call it. But you can forward ports the other direction too. Mm -hmm. And that would be things from inside your network that are being transformed to go out onto the internet. That's a lot less common. I have not seen that as much. Typically, with home equipment like, like we have right here, uh, what you have, and I just broke this thing again, mm -hmm. what you have with these, these home equipment is all the outbound ports are open. So anything that's leaving your, your network is typically allowed by default unless you've gone in there and restricted. But inbound is where almost everything is blocked except things that are replies. So that means when you go to somewhere, the replies coming back uh, actually are allowed in. And so what I did was I went ahead and I made a video uh, to show you how to do port forwarding on a Linksys router uh, that is that's owned by Cisco. So we're going to run that video and let you take a look at what I had to say. So Doug, I'm going to turn this over to you on in the other realm. So, well, thanks, Doug and Russ. This is the other Doug on the other end of something. Uh, I decided to make a, a packet tracer. I know you can't believe it at this point that I would actually use packet tracer again to show you what a house might look like 
if you were using port forwarding with a really simple uh, router that's being simulated here, but it's the same thing that you would be using if you had a real router. And basically what you have here is, is a kind of modern home. And uh, this one has a printer, and there's some people that use it, and a web server. Uh, this is a, a VOIP, which stands for Voice Over IP, which would be something like you might see with, a, with what they call an internet phone system or something like that. I'm not going to say a brand name. I have one, but I'm not going to say it because they don't pay me to say it. So, um, But there's a lot of different varieties of these, and they basically use the internet instead of old-fashioned telephone wires uh, to do this. A webcam that could be a security camera or even a security system, and a... Uh, uh, a thermostat system that might be part of Internet of Things type uh, controllers, they got Nest or some something like that. And then I, I put this lamp here, which would be another representation of some other kind of Internet of Things, which uh, could be you know all the lights on your property or something like that. So if you wanted to control you know all of your lights, security lights, you know lights inside, outside, whatever, you could do that through some kind of server or controller like this. And the idea would be that, that you sitting out here at Starbucks could access all these things. Typically, you don't want others to access these things, which makes port forwarding, and we, we talk about this in the show a bit, a, a bit of a risky venture. And the minute you start opening known things, other people out in the world know about those known things, and they can look for them as well. For instance, 9100 is a very common port for printing. And people scan for this because they know if they could find a printer that has a exploit, they may be able to get to it uh, because you're port forwarding. And that can, of course, be a huge problem. Likewise, if you've watched any of the other shows on the network, like Security Weekly, you know, we talk a lot about Internet of Things. And these kind of things like thermostats and lighting systems can have serious exploits uh, available to them, and if they run on known ports, which they typically do, then that means people from outside could look for this address with this port open. Now, port forwarding is a little bit trickier to detect uh, because the router kind of handles it, but it's easy enough for somebody to scan in the world. So what happens is, if this is somebody, if you're out here looking for this, you send out traffic, it goes out over the internet, and you're sending it to this known IP address. And we're going to do another show about what do you do when you don't have a known IP address. So that's called dynamic DNS. But we, we haven't talked about that yet. But right now, uh, we're just going to assume you have some way to get to this IP address. I will tell you that your outside address doesn't change very much unless you have a lot of power outages or you turn your router on and off all the time. Typically, mine doesn't change that often. I have a static one that I pay for, but... Uh, if you don't and you, you just have a standard subscription, it can change, but it may, maybe doesn't change very often. We'll talk about that some other time as well. But this wireless router then can be configured, and this is a very typical uh, home router. Uh, this one's a wireless in broadband router that uh, Linksys makes, and Cisco owns Linksys, so you tend to see uh, these kind of routers. I don't actually remember the number of this. Oh, it's a WRT300N, so it's a couple of years old. But this is a, a very standard kind of uh, protocol. I'm going to try to get it in some format that looks better so you can actually see it a little better right here on the screen. And this is just, you know, I mean, if you have a different brand or make and model, we've talked about this on the show before. I'm going to show you another one on the show today uh, when we go back to the studio. But most of these types of devices have some kind of setup for this. This one, this Linksys model, actually has a section called Applications and Gaming. And in, in this type of router, they actually do have over here some things that are, that are known. And most of them will have this. This is very common kinds of traffic. But I didn't use any of that. I set all mine up uh, specifically to this. So I went down here and I, the first one I did was I created something called Printer. And, it, and, I, and I'm, I am not even beginning to talk about the security of this. This setup right here would be very risky. So be advised, before you do this, you may want to think very seriously about what you're doing. 
this is a very risky thing to do. So you'd love when you don't try this at home. That's when it gets the most fun is when somebody tells you don't try it at home and then you do. You can get hacked to pieces doing things like this. Um, so, but, but, I, but this is just to illustrate what it is, and we're going to kind of keep building on these things for a while in, on this show. Uh, but so what happens is there's an external port, and you can change the internal port. That's called port redirection. But really what we're doing here mostly is we're redirecting traffic. And I'm going to move this out of the way again for just a second so that we can see. When, when a packet arrives right here, so this is the outside, or this is your cable modem at your home or whatever. When a packet arrives right there, what happens is if that packet is addressed to 1.1.1.2.9100 TCP, or in this case UDP as well, that packet is forwarded to the address 192.168.1.100. So that is the IP address of my printer. So this router rewraps that traffic and sends it to this device here. I've got some more to show you. Here's one for a web server, 80, 80, and it goes to 80. And you'd have to set all this up. So and these devices would have to be set up. Now here's one for my, my telephone traffic. And it's coming into 5061, it's going to 5061, it's UDP, and all these are, and they could all be the same, too, if you were forwarding them all to the same place. So you could have a server that's doing more than one thing. So like that's your inbound uh, VOIP traffic. Here's a, an interesting one. Now this one has a combination of port forwarding and what is called port redirection. And what happens in port redirection is I already used port 80. And so what I did was I set up my webcam to, to be on, my webcam runs on port 80, but on the outside, I set it up to be sent to 8080. And so now, unlike this, if I get an 80, it goes to 80. If I get an 8080, it still goes to port 80 inside, but it goes to 88. And that would forward that. And then you see I can specify different kinds of protocols here. And so I've got my thermostat, which meant my, and here's another example. My thermostat requires multiple open ports. So I have to make sure that I have all the ports that I need open. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple other things in this that I don't have set up, but, uh, and, and then my lamp. So this is my lighting system. Same thing. And you can see this real quickly then. Also on this uh, device, which I don't, we can't, I, we're going to show you in the studio, sorry, I, I couldn't show that on here because they didn't make those features available in the simulator. But ranges mean that you may have a large number of ranges, and it is very common for voice over IP now to use like ports that have a huge range of ports, so they, they put on it so it can randomize. Here's the real quick risk, and we'll talk about this more on the show. The real quick risk, of course, is that other people know these things, and they go looking for them. If you're using products that have exploits, then they go find that a certain kind of printer has an exploit. They can search for port 9100, and if you're opening that, you could then actually be at risk. So be careful about doing this, and we're going to talk a little more about that on the show. All right, so Doug, Russ, I know you guys are back over there, so take it away. Thanks. Brilliant. Oh, it was brilliant, Doug. I mean, that was <laughs> I was overwhelmed with emotion when, when, they, when I saw that. But one of the things I was going to mention was I, I used to have a neighbor a long time ago, and my neighbor had a printer that was open like that. And I used to send messages just raw to port 9100 at his IP address, and I would send things like, the duck walks backwards with a male prostitute at midnight. <laughs> and he would come to my house, and he would bring the print out, and he would go, what do, what do you think this means? Do, do you think this is like, I was like, oh, I know what that means. That's like NSA right there, man. They're after you. Ooh. They're watching what you're doing. You weren't looking at porn, were you? <laughs> and he's like, what? No, no, never, never. I've never, <laughs> never looked at porn. But one of the things I wanted to bring up, and that Russ is going to show us how to do, was a range of ports. And one of the things that uh, you saw in my demo was using what is called SIP, and SIP, uh, SIP is a type of VOIP 
protocol. But a lot of home VOIP has changed, and they now use big ranges of ports. And so you would actually have to go in, and for instance, it's very common for a very common kind of home uh, VOIP to use ports 10,000 through 20,000. Remember, there's 65,536 possible ports. So 10,000 to 20,000 would get a little out of hand. Uh, speaking of out of hand, I don't know what that was. I, I, I heard a noise. A so if, yeah. if you see them come in and take over the studio, you'll know what the hell is happening here. And it's like, it's been great serving you, but and now we'll be singing the national anthem of North Korea. <laughs> oh, uh, boy. Da, yeah. I, I, I wish I knew the Borat anthem by heart, but I would have <laughs> sung it right there. Number one producer of potassium. Okay, I shouldn't get offensive. But Russ is going to show us how to set up a range because you might use it for VOIP. Uh, and another very common one that people used to use was passive FTP, which required a whole range of ports to be forwarded mm -hmm. to that FTP server. Don't use FTP at home. Please don't do that. But nevertheless, you will see those kind of things. So we're going to let Russ kick it over and show us how to do a range on the Netgear router that's sitting cool. right here. Thanks, Doug. Um, so on this, we'll switch over to my computer screen now. And on the screen, you're going to see um, the setup for the Netgear Genie, which we've been playing with over the last three, three shows. Uh, or two shows, this would be the third. And to get into port forwarding, I want to go into advanced. Okay, and then uh, uh, from advanced, I want to actually go into uh, advanced setup. And I want to go into port forwarding slash port triggering. Okay, and what I've done here, just for demonstration purposes, is I've actually set up, uh, I've set up one, which Doug talked about uh, in his video, called Printer. And you'll notice that the uh, two external ports, uh, well, the external port range, uh, 10 to 25, is uh, forwarding into the 10 to 25 internal port range for this particular, uh, for this particular IP address, which is my Mac, uh, which you're looking at uh, on the screen right now. So how do I set some stuff up? All right. So we're going to first set up a port forward uh, for a single port. And uh, what they've done here uh, is they've given you some basic ones that Doug demonstrated on the video. Uh, Telnet, Real Audio, which I don't even think Real Audio is around <laughs> anymore. Um, Quake 3, Quake 2, you can see how Ooh. old this is. This router is 2000, so what is it, 15 years, so well, 17 Retro. years old. Yeah, a long time ago in a galaxy far away. Um, and so you've got these, um, and so I can certainly grab one of these services. Uh, we'll do FTP just because Doug said don't do it at home, um, but it's a good demo. And uh, so we'll, uh, let's say that a, uh, let's say that 25 is the IP address right. for, yeah, so let's just go with that. And we're going to click add uh, the specified ports being used, uh, other configurations. Okay, fine. So. You can see here that that's how you do a single. Uh, that's how you do a single forward. So, let's talk more about multiple forwarding because that's something that you might use more of, uh, for, especially for VoIP, like Doug was talking about. So, I'm going to come down here, uh, the bottom here, where it says Add Custom Services. All right, and we're going to click on um, Add Custom Service. We're going to let it load. Again, forgive the amount of time it takes. It is 15. I think it's 15 years old. All right, and here we are. So we're going to start with a service name, and we're going to call it FTP2, just for the heck of it. Okay? And uh, the protocols, uh, the major ones, TCP, UD, UDP, uh, or you can do a combination of both. And that's what this uh, drop-down right here is suggesting right now, that we're going to forward ports on bo in both protocols. But you can choose just TCP or d just UDP by selecting one of these. We'll just assume that we're using both TCP and UDP. And we're going to start um, external sharing port on, let's say we want to do a range of 20 to 30, just to be safe. So we're going to choose uh, port 20 here on the external starting port. We're going to choose 30 here on the external ending port. And it says use the same port range for internal ports. That may be a, a, a case where you, where you want to use the existing ports on the internal part of your network. Or you can uncheck that box and choose, like Doug was talking about, maybe he rerouted it to 8020 or forwarded it to 8020. So let's try that 8020 to 8030. So right. there you go. So now we're forwarding 20 to 30 on the external side to internal 80, 20, 80, 30. Okay? And uh, we can choose uh, which internal IP addresses that's going to uh, work for. Uh, let's just say that we want to go up to, let's say it's just for 200, just for the heck of it. And now that we have this configuration set, we're going to click Apply. And are being used by other servers. Please check. Okay, so let me just do that there and see what happens. I just chose the MacBook Pro. 
and it took it. So, and now what you'll see here is that we have FTP2 set up where we're forwarding external start ports of 20 to external end ports of 30. So 20 to 30 are being forwarded to 80, 20, 8 to 80, 30 um, on the internal IP address of dot, dot .1.2. So that's how you do the multiple, multiple forwarding. And, and there you have it. I mean, all, uh, your router may look different than this. There, mm -hmm. there are many, many different brands and models and makes, and they all have their own little GUI systems that they've put in there. But the idea is exactly the same. And you can do this with, with yours if you need to. Now, one of the basic rules of security is don't open doors that don't need to be open. And whenever you do this, you're opening not just a door, you may be opening multiple doors. So you, you heard us talk about TCP, UDP. Those are two different protocols. So if you open port 22, TCP, and UDP, you've opened two doors. And I will tell you that people on the internet know what those things are. If you open port 22, what that is is it's called secure shell. It's a way to log into servers. And people scan for that constantly. And they look for 22 TCP to try to find, are you running it? And if they do, they will start trying to brute force break into those things. So if you decide to do this, you need to think very carefully about what it is exactly that you're doing. Now, when you get your little how to set it up manual for your home VOIP or whatever you got, it will say, oh, open the following port and blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. You may need to do that. But there's a huge risk associated uh, with those things. So uh, what kind of tactics? You, you have a lot of stuff. You have open ports. What, what do you do? How do you think about that? Well, so I, I just, I do the bare minimum. And so if it works, I don't mess with it. But if, so let's say, you know, I got a PlayStation 4 and I have, I have three different wireless networks at my house. I have one for my family, uh, one for myself, and then one for guests because I want to keep them all separate. So um, if I need to put, uh, a, a, put a game on and do some port forwarding, like let's say, you know, I'm using, uh, I don't know, Running Man or or whatever, whatever game I might be playing at any time, Final Fantasy, let's say. Um, you know, I look at the website, the manufacturer's website, and it says, well, we recommend that you send port forwarding for multiplayer gaming to these particular ports. And I'll only do the bare minimum what it says. Right. If it says TCP and or UDP, I won't do UDP. Right. I'll just do TCP first just to maintain that level of security. If it doesn't work... Then I'll just do. Then I'll do the UDP also. So right. you know, maintain the maintain the least amount of open doors as possible. And I, I think that's a pretty reasonable approach. It's still a risk because yeah. you've opened a door, and that means that things can come in. Yep. And if they come in, uh, you you may be able to do that. Now, obfuscation which is also sometimes called security through obscurity. And, and I call it stupid security to some degree because people will figure it out and they do understand this stuff. Mm -hmm. But you can obfuscate ports uh, simply by switching them up. So if, for instance, you run port 8080 on the outside and that's a web server, you know that that's what that is. Other people scan it and they see port 8080. They may not know what it is. So that adds a very, very, very tiny little uh, a bit of security. But anybody that actually knows what they're doing will then probe that port and have the report reply to them, yep. and they'll go, oh, no, that's a web server. And then the minute that they know that's an Apache web server or whatever it is, mm -hmm. they can start looking for either known exploits mm -hmm. or, or zero-day exploits. So if you do do this, be absolutely certain that you patch everything. So you need to be sure you're patched up on whatever services you're offering. So the demons that you're running inside need to be patched up so that they to have as uh, smallest uh, threat vector yep. as they possibly can, or threat surface is the, is the term they use, to, to prevent people from being able to exploit those things. And what that leads us into then is what uh, on our next show, so this is, uh, this is, be sure and tune in, on our next show, we want to talk about filtering blacklisting, whitelisting, uh, so that you can better control what kind of things have access because as you add things to your threat surface in, in your world, at thermostats, lamps, or, or servers, or gaming, or whatever you add, you are increasing the number of ways people can get at you. And so now you need to start thinking seriously about whitelisting, which is, is, is basically means that you're going to only allow certain people to contact you. And sometimes that's difficult because you say, well, I travel constantly and I want to get to my server. So you may need to think about other approaches to that, like VPN and things like that, that we have talked about on the show, and we'll talk about some more. So be sure and tune in next time when we talk about Mac filtering, blacklisting, and whitelisting on Secure Digital Life. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. <laughs>